why are they interested in us? Firstly, it's their job to protect cultures like ours who are in development and threatened by other extraterrestrial species. They do not only help Earth, they help other cultures who are threatened by off-world invaders, humans of Earth have different DNAs that have been injected into our DNA along the history of Earth and they want to preserve this and this attracts a lot of regressive ETs. The strongest and the more clever will survive and maintain the species in the optimum capacities. You basically went to the typical terrifying alien abduction where you were taken for experimentation. But this other crew saved you. I was taken through a portal. The ship, in fact, had an interdimensional leap and I lost consciousness, so I don't recall how long it was, unfortunately. If we have come to contact with them, what it would mean for our civilization? I know that the contact has been made already and there are many different secret programs between our governments and organization of extraterrestrials. You can have in one building people who work on secret space programs and others who know absolutely nothing about it. And all this technology are very, very, very powerful. How is their day-to-day -day life? Well, they, they sleep, they eat, they digest and everything else. They have emotions. They are pretty much similar to us. The difference would be they have a, a more evolved uh, awareness of themselves. Are there inhabitants on Venice? They live in underground cities because it's not livable on the surface. How big is a typical city in Venice? I have visited one and I can speak about this one only. There was a valley with an artificial holographic sky and artificial sun. I was shown Earth in 100 years from now and nature is repairing and regenerating. The architecture of 100 years in the future is in perfect balance with nature. The towns have a lot of green spaces and trees. Hello everybody, today we go back again talking about this uh, complex and very fascinating topic of life beyond the human life in the universe and technologies beyond what we know today. We have already talked with Dan Willis about technologies that the US government and other governments seem to have that are absolutely top secret. Today, we're going to look at the same topic from a different perspective. We're going to look at, are there other intelligences around the universe that somehow have an interest in us and what is their interest? But also, we're going to discover the experiences of uh, a very special person that us, uh, by chance, found herself into a number of adventures that I bet most of you will not believe, but would pay millions of dollars to experience. So without further ado, we're going to talk to Elena Danan, who is a former French archaeologist. She worked in Egypt and she was an Egyptologist before becoming today a writer. And she has her own podcast. She talks a lot about extraterrestrial intelligence and experiences with entities that come from other worlds. Hello, Elena. How are you today? Hello, Paolo. I'm very well. Thank you. Elena, I want to do this. I want to ask you a few very quick questions. What is the farthest place from your home that you have ever visited? It was actually Al Nilam star system in the Orion constellation. Oh, that's a little far. How far is it from us? Um, it's about 2,000 light years from here. Oh, God, that's a, that's a big statement. How long did it take for you to go there? Well, the way I've been there, it was in a spaceship. I was taken through an interdimensional portal. The ship, in fact, had an interdimensional leap, as I was explained. And I lost consciousness, so I don't recall how long. It was, unfortunately. So during this trip, how did you feel? Were you comfortable? Were you warm? Were you cold? Well, first I was extremely excited. So excited. It was like if I have had too much coffee, I was so excited. And then I relaxed. 
the air was just about fresh and uh, it was very comfortable. I don't recall a long time in this ship because uh, we went straight away quite quickly into this interdimensional leap through hyperspace, I suppose. But the, when you say we went through hyperspace, was the entire ship or, or just your body? The entire ship. The entire ship. And where were you sitting? Were you sitting somewhere? Were you standing up? They made me sit in a very comfortable chair with armrest. It was made in a type of synthetic plastic, smooth, white and translucent. What about the temperature? Was it like, you know, in our most advanced cars, we have uh, kind of the eating on the seat. Was the seat comfortable? How did you feel on this seat? I didn't feel a change of temperature when I, I sat in it, but uh, it's like if the seat wrapped my body, my body sank a little bit into the, the material and the material just was adapted ergonomically to my body. We will discuss the advanced top secret technological developments at the first Silicon Valley conference on secret space technologies business applications. Experiences and witnesses of advanced technology will present how they have interacted with innovations and discoveries far beyond our current reality, but that may one day become our reality. In this conference, we will discuss the futuristic civilian applications of these technologies to our economy. It is about time that we start challenging our current beliefs and limitations and start to envision a more advanced civilization for us and our children. One day, we may be using some of these secret space technologies to build viable civilian business applications. Have you personally ever met an extraterrestrial biological entity? Yes, I did, and many times. And how did you really feel the first time you were in presence of an extraterrestrial biological entity? I was very, very frightened. I was a toddler, I remember, and a small gray alien appeared in the, in the bedroom and I was terrified. What did you feel like the day after, if you remember? I felt very disturbed not understanding if this was part of the normal world. I didn't know. I was very confused. The second time I met an extraterrestrial entity, it was a tall being, very benevolent. When I was taken on board the ship, I was very small. And it was very gentle and the experience was different. And the following day, I felt different. I felt that there was something else to this planet, this universe, something more. And I also felt very lonely on Earth because I was on my own. I couldn't share this experience with others. Okay, as of today, do you have any friend who was not really born on planet Earth? Yes, I have several friends, ETs that I can call my friends. Have you ever been emotionally close to someone who was not born on planet Earth? Yes. yes. Have you ever been in love with an extraterrestrial biological entity, as they say here in, in the United States? Well, yes, yes. Do they look strange or do they look like us, the one that you were in love with? Well, you know, love has a different dimension, a higher, broader dimension when you are confronted to different life forms. I experience uh, being in love with two extraterrestrial beings who look different. One was because he was emanating love. He wasn't physically in our standards. He was different looking. He was not human, but his heart and his radiance was energy of love. And um, I was feeling really well in his presence. And the other person, it's more um, a feeling of love as we could describe it on earth. It's someone, a humanoid. He has different features. He has bigger eyes and uh, high cheekbones and he's a bit taller. Are there inhabitants on Venice? Yes, there are. May they live uh, underground, in underground cities, because, you know, it's not livable on the surface. How big is a typical city in Venice? I have visited one, and I can speak about this one only. It was an underground city, what 
amazed me was that it was a big space, very wide underground space. It was, there was a valley with an artificial holographic sky and artificial sun. And uh, the city wasn't that big. It was like a big town. Inside it, there is a sun, which is an artificial sun. What is this artificial sun? What did they tell you it works like? They told me it is made with antimatter. It uses antimatter. And how do people move around in this city on, on Venus? Oh, they have anti-gravity vehicles, like um, anti-gravity cars to go everywhere. And everybody moves with his own thing or it's a more of a public service? I had the impression that you pick uh, a public anti-gravity car. I suppose maybe people have their, some people have their own. I do not know, which is possible. Why not? But the one I've been in was taken from a public space. How long do people in Venus live? It depends on the races. There are different extraterrestrial races there. Um, the humanoids like us, they live uh, several hundred years, but it is not due to being in Venus. It's due to their genetics. Under the years from now, will Earth be different? 100 years from now, yes. Nature will repair itself. It will be a clean, more clean planet. I've seen nature everywhere. I was shown Earth in 100 years from now and nature is repairing and regenerating. There are cities functioning with clean energy, renewable energies, all these energies that have been taken away from us and developed even more. Like a city 100 years from now would be like now or would be different? And how will it look like? It made me think about Dubai, this kind of architecture. Most cities would be like Dubai. Like we have a Dubai feature or we go all to Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of um, futuristic architecture. But what's different from Dubai, for instance, the difference and the particularity was that the architecture of 100 years in the future is in perfect balance with nature. The towns have nature, a lot of green spaces and trees. It's a good balance with nature. If you had an adjective to describe what you have seen, what would be that adjective? Repaired. And we know that you've been in touch with a particular crew of extraterrestrials. This, this crew has a commander, I think it's called Tor An. How many times in your life have you interacted with this crew of, of, of people? I do not recall a special number because it's a lot of times. These people rescued me when I was a child. So from the time I was a child to 2018, it was at the rhythm of twice a year. And then... It's now very often, I would say to give a number about 50 times. So for people that haven't known completely your story, maybe we can go really quickly to summarize it. You basically went to the typical terrifying alien abduction where you were taken for experimentation. But this other crew saved you from basically starting that other program. They put you in a different program. Otherwise, you had been for like 20, 30 years, you had been in their program doing experiments they would come three or four times a year pick you up do reproductive experiment this would be the bad ones okay more or less that's kind of the story for for most of uh, other people instead you were saved by this uh, particular commander and his crew and then from that time on you have developed a relationship did they ever explain why they saved you and why they developed a relationship afterwards like why they kept coming back a couple of times a year when I was abducted as a child, I was nine years old by these small gray aliens. It was physical. It wasn't psychologic. I was hospitalized two months afterwards because I was physically wounded. Well, these good crew who rescued me kept contact with me afterwards because I have some, let us say, psychic abilities. And it was interesting for them to keep contact with me and interact. Why did they save you? You know, it is their job. They are part of a bigger uh, organization, which is a federation of uh, different cultures. And there are several crews helping people 
and saving uh, abductees as much as they can. And I was lucky. Why are they, these good ones, let's say the benevolence, somebody calls them benevolent, why are they interested in us? Because firstly, it's their job to protect cultures like ours who are in development and threatened by other extraterrestrial species who experiment on us. This benevolent federation works at protecting people and worlds like ours. That's why first they do that. I know, but that is, it's as if uh, I enlist in the U.S. Army and my captain tells me, go and save somebody in uh, a small other country. Okay, but that's an order that I receive. But there has to be a reason, a deeper reason. Why do they believe that this is a good thing to do? They work for balance in the galaxy. And it's part of their ethics and laws to help threatened cultures. They do not only help Earth, they help other cultures who are in this situation, who are threatened by off-world invaders. There is something that is interesting about Earth is that they told me that uh, humans of Earth have different DNAs that have been injected into our DNA along the history of Earth, and they want to preserve this, and this attracts a lot of uh, regressive ETs. Have you ever seen documentaries like The Living Planet? In nature, what happens is, if they're mammals, you have a mother that takes care of the young kids. But in nature, there are predators that actually go after the kids because they're easy to eat, if you like. So now the parallel is that when you have a new civilization, not necessarily in the very first steps, but it's still in a development phase. So this civilization becomes extremely vulnerable to predatory behavior. So do you think that the parallel makes sense or are there elements of this parallel that are a little bit different? I think the parallel makes a lot of sense and it is, it's a very good parallel. They, this federation, this organization, works according to the laws of evolution, the universal laws of evolution, which is free will and learning. And it involves being eaten sometimes. Now imagine the mama bear protects her child as much as she can against predators. Well, sometimes the predators you know, eat the child and it seen from a broader perspective, it's called evolution, not nature. The, the strongest and the more clever will survive and maintain the species in the optimum capacities. So nobody will intervene in that because it's nature. Now, imagine an army of predators who are way more powerful come and start to kill all the bears and the bears are about to be decimated. Now, that is not the law of nature. That is something that needs to be rebalanced to give this bear species a chance to survive. This is the parallel I could make. This organization has been keeping us alive as a species, trying to intervene the less as possible into our evolution. So they seem moral beings. What is your perception of their morality and, and ethics? Well, having studied other cultures on Earth, the notion of good and bad is relative to the culture. Sometimes something that is good for a culture will be bad for another. When we step out of good and bad, because, you know, in the universe, it's a balance between creation and destruction. That's how it works. When you step out of this, well, you see a broader perspective, which is maintaining an equilibrium, a balance. And this balance sometimes involves letting people getting killed. You know, sometimes you need an enemy, you need a predator to allow yourself to discover your strengths and activate your intelligence. And that's how evolution works. We are always a predator or someone else, but we help the prey to develop intelligence and skills. And that's how we help this, the species of the prey evolve because those who will be more clever and more fit will survive. And these best genes in the species will reproduce. So that's the balance of nature. But that bears a question. Behind any decision, behind any strategy, 
there is a system of values and there is a system of threshold, like when to get in and when, when to get out. This means that whoever is protected from them is also subject to their judgment on what they find right to protect and not right to protect. In a way, they also intervene in the overall balance because they intervene with their judgment. What do you think about this? Have you ever thought about this element? Regarding judgment, I think they judge a whole species in its globality. And the species needs to keep on going and, and, and strive and survive. And uh, they, they have a set of laws who are based, which are based on natural principles and laws, cosmic laws, the laws of evolution and free will. That's something that they abide by. About judgment, I think I can understand they don't judge that they are bad people, good people. They are just people and from different cultures. And each one is following their, their own agendas. I've had an interesting mind-changing contact with a species. These species are tall greys who perform abductions on Earth. And they are not nice with Earth children. And in their own culture, they protect their children and they love their children. And their children is everything for them. But they will trade the children of other species. Then this made me really think about the notion of ethics and good and bad, because I realized us humans, we are doing the same thing on Earth, you know, with animals that we eat and we, we, we are protecting and loving our own children. We can die for our own children, but we will eat the children of animal species, such as cows, for instance. We will discuss above top secret technological developments at the first Silicon Valley Conference on Secret Space Technology Business Applications. Experiencies and witnesses of advanced technologies will present how they have interacted with innovations and discoveries far beyond our current reality, but one day possibly becoming our reality. In this conference, we will discuss the futuristic civilian applications of these technologies to our economy. It is about time that we start challenging our current beliefs and limitations and start to envision a more advanced civilization for us and our children. One day, we may be using some of these secret space technologies to build viable civilian business applications. What have you learned from them that then you can use in your own life? Knowing them, knowing these beings from other worlds, has brought me a broader perspective on things. And that is what I would, would wish everyone would gain to understand better. When you see things from either a broader, global, more global perspective, and then what we call the bigger picture. And then also, second thing, seeing things from different perspectives, who you interact with, what is the perspective of this being that interacts with you? So you need to be aware that this person has a different perspective and accept it. And that's something that I've learned with them. I, I apply in my life now. It's very interesting. Can you give an example of what it means to accept a different perspective and how it makes the human relationship better? Having a discussion that transforms into an argument with someone because you don't agree with something before, I would think, well, this person thinks wrong or what this person does, I judge it and I judge it that it is wrong regarding to my criteria. And we start to agree, trying to convince each other that our personal perspective is the right one. Well, since I start to have contacts with beings from other cultures, I learn how to take in account that the other person strongly, firmly believes in their argument because they have a background, they have a culture, a family, a background, a cultural background, a study background that makes them think different. And from that proper experience of life, they will be drawn to think differently and act differently. And knowing that being taking this in consideration when having a discussion, conversation with someone is changing everything because you cannot argue because you tolerate you and understand that there's a, there is an other perspective that is not yours and accept it. 
how do you balance really at the philosophical or psychological level, accepting multiple perspectives and so more of a relativistic approach to existence with the need, or if you like, with the concept of an absolute complex on what's right and bad for yourself? Like, how do you balance these two different philosophical approaches, if you like? I would talk about resonance and dissonance. I believe that the purpose of sentient life is to evolve not only genetically, but in consciousness. And to evolve in consciousness, I believe it is evolving in awareness of our position into an, our environment, and not only planetary environment, but universal environment. And to develop this awareness, we need to be in a good state of mind. We need to be peaceful and relatively happy with, with ourselves in a good positive state of mind that we're not suffering. Suffering to me is dissonance. So from this, I draw the notion of ethics between good and bad. What is good for evolution and what is bad for evolution? Bad for evolution is uh, probably harming and torturing and causing suffering and pain and sadness. It is okay. It is part of evolution. But when it is done freely to just harm, I do not think it helps. I do not agree with it. So I would say, look at what do we need to evolve being more respectful to each other, stop harming each other, stop creating dissonance and try to be resonant with the universe. How is the day-to-day life? Yes, um, let's say about uh, with uh, the humanoids who are our closest cousins. Well, they, they sleep, they eat, they digest and everything else. They have emotions. They are pretty much similar to us. The difference would be they have a a more evolved uh, awareness of themselves, their consciousness, their place in the universe of the bigger picture, as we can call it. What it means being more aware. I would say connected. Connecting is knowing. When you connect to something, you start to learn about it. So connecting with who you are, connecting to the universe. That means expanding your consciousness to what the universe is by connecting with your feelings, you know, with the heart, with the emotion. When you connect with something with your inner self, you connect with this thing and you can learn about it. I will give you an example. You can learn everything you want about the wind. You can become an engineer, very knowledgeable, very, very good at knowing how the wind works. And what the wind is made of, well, you will never truly know the wind because you need to connect with the wind. Go outside in the storm and you will know the wind because it will go through you. You will taste it, hear it, smell it, sense it, and then you will truly know the wind. That is being connected to the wind, being aware of what the wind is. It's a higher way of learning about things, the connection. This is something that always comes up this dimension of a higher consciousness that I think a lot of people might not fully grasp. It's a topic that always comes back every time that you talk about secret space program, uh, extraterrestrials, uh, other intelligence in the universe. This element of consciousness is always there. And it seems to be, to me, the biggest gap between our perception of reality and the perception of reality of these other beings. Why do you think I have troubles to fully grasp this concept? It's still a question of perspective. We try to analyze something, explain it with our perspective, but we do not have all the tools to understand it. Consciousness works with the connectivity of consciousness. It works with frequencies and vibrations. It doesn't fit the measurement that we use to measure physicality. We need another set of measurements. It's all in terms of brain waves, frequencies, quantum connections, entanglement. This is going to be difficult because yes. we associate, for example, quantum entanglement. There is an entire science that we have, and it's very difficult to connect it with what you're saying today. So this is, this is the area where I see a challenge. I'd like to go back again into your experience 
with these beings. And I would like to ask you, what should we learn as human beings from them? Like, what can we learn? Well, yes, indeed, I would say trying to see things from a broader perspective, from higher, taking distance from something. Also, what we should learn uh, from them is tolerance and non-judgment. Because when you don't understand something, do not judge it. Just accept that it is different. One day, hopefully, you will understand this person, this culture, this technology. But as you do not have the tools, do not judge regarding to your emotions. Do they have religion? How is their spirituality different than our spirituality? Well, you know, um, every culture starts by having a religion, wand wondering how to explain the, the universe. But when you reach a certain stage of evolution, and I would say a development in, in awareness in your consciousness, you start to yes. understand that you start to connect with the universe. And when you start to connect with the universe and understand what the universe is, you do not need religions anymore. You just can connect directly with what can call God or what can call the cosmos by yourself. I suppose that there are millions of cultures in the galaxy that are still at a stage where they have religions, but there are maybe as much or more cultures who have reached a certain stage in their evolution that they do not have global planetary religions because they can connect directly with source and the cosmos and understand what it is about. Here's the thing. If I look at one of your books, there is a picture of a temple in Venus. Why, why do they have a temple? The temple I saw on Venus is not uh, linked to religion. It's a generator. And there's a, there was a pyramid behind holding a generator inside, produce energy supply for the town. And what looked like a temple on the front of it was just the, the building where the, the people, the, the employees would be there. But they have also this particular society on Venus that I saw. They, the, if you want the free energy that is used to supply the city, is something that they um, honor kind of spiritually. Uh, they, be, they believe that is, this energy is uh, composing the whole universe and is even in the void everywhere, and you just need to harvest it. And just this is a kind of recognition as something sacred. If we have a come to contact with them on a mass scale today, what it would mean for our civilization? I know that the contact has been made already, and there are many different secret programs between our governments and positive organization of extraterrestrials. Now we are talking about civilian contact, open civilian contact. Well, the civilians need to be ready for that. We need to have overcome our own challenges socially politically then being ready being ready means being in relatively peace get on with each other more or less because you know if they would come now in just today it would be chaos we do not need more chaos on earth because suddenly we will stop treating our problems and just being distracted by them coming and we will focus on all oh, these extraterrestrials are here and we will stop trying to treat our problems. So that, that is going to cause more dissonance and chaos. So we need first to sort out a few problems we have at the moment. I, I, I want to take a step back here. One second. <laughs> you mentioned that there are secret programs uh, with the Earth governments. But then you go and talk to these uh, various politicians and it seems that they don't know anything. Who the hell are in contact with? Like these secret contacts are with whom? It's with the president, with the parliament or with somebody else? In every government, you have main, main governments. You have two different categories. You have a group who will uh, work with regressive extraterrestrials and also their own interest, personal interest, like corporations and uh, things like this. Okay. So you would have one group that would work with predatory extraterrestrials and another group who would work with 
benevolent extraterrestrials. So the benevolent ex extraterrestrials have started programs of defense, co programs of cooperation of technology with some groups in the governments. They don't interact with the president. It has happened in history that some presidents have been aware of this because they were working with the good side, positive for humanity, I mean. But usually it's military. It's all military. And these military groups work on their own. It's very compartmentalized, very much. You can have uh, in one building people who work on secret space programs and others who know absolutely nothing about it. You think that if we were to interact now with these civilizations, this would be more detrimental than an advantage because we would be focusing on them rather than focusing on us. And we haven't yet reached the point where we can live in peace with one another on this planet. There are the, all these secret uh, space programs that I, I fully don't understand because they're passing technologies that are far, far advanced than where we are. What is your perspective on that? I know that this world is not only working with people who want the good of humanity. All these sp secret space programs work with groups of people, military mainly, they're all military, who protect Earth. And all these technology are very, very, very powerful. Now, why the civilians are, don't have yet access to it? It is because the majority of elected politicians and working with corporations do not want the civilians to have access to it. They want the civilians to pay taxes, to buy petrol, and they want themselves to enrich themselves with the civilians. They do not want the civilians to have access to this technology for a business a profit. These politicians and corporations, they are not working with the secret space program. They are, you know, antagonist uh, groups. So if the secret space program will roll out, uh, offer to the public these technologies, it would be shut down straight away by the, these political groups and corporations. They don't want free energy for us. They want us to keep on buying petrol, for instance, or paying electricity bills, you know, because they... So even if this technology was given to us now, it would be stopped. Have you ever talked to them about our past? Where did we come from? What do they know about us? They know our history better than we do because uh, we've been told a side of history that is apparently uh, incomplete. For example, I've been told that there has been cycles of civilizations, that humanity is older than we think. You know, the earth has tectonic continents, you know, that's moved. And so it has been, there has been uh, also ice ages, so different natural changes that put an end to cultures and civilizations naturally. And um, of these, we do not have any records. Did they tell you something specific or was more of a broader conversation? Kind of a broader conversation. And I asked, <laughs> I asked dates, of course. Um, they said that um, the cycles of civilization started beyond 100,000 years BC, beyond that. And I went, that's impossible. Of course, we do not have any trace from that, but there they were different races of humans on earth you know some more advanced than others and there was also extraterrestrial uh, colonies and input as well did I do they not live know together lot. yes in that they had territories they had they were territorial they had territories some uh, extraterrestrial colonies were very uh, secluded not really disturbing other earth more primary populations you know, the earth wasn't that much populated, not as much as now anyway. So what you're saying is the earth was not populated that much. Some civilizations were started a long time ago, but they never come into contact with other parts of the globe. So they extinguished it themselves before they could yes. come into contact with others. Would they give us the videotape? <laughs> <laughs> Well, when we make contact, civilian contact with, with them, you know, they have a whole database in their ships. Uh, I haven't had access to it. What do you think? Where do we come from? What I've been told is that we are a mix of different genetics. 
some coming from other galaxies even. That has been performed on, on us since a very long time. Where do we come from? Well, first of all, we are Earthlings. That's our planet. We've been developing on this planet since a very long time. So it's our home. So we are Earthlings. But who the Earthlings are, they are a mix, I've been told, of different genetics. And we are unique. Although we have close cousins because they have the same mix and the same genes. Look on Earth, all the different types of races. And um, how do you explain that, you know? Where do we think we are going as human civilization in relationship to these extraterrestrials? We are going towards a progressive and positive future. I am convinced of this because I have been shown this future and I've been explained why we are going there. Because humans of Earth are waking up to what's going on in the world, or how they've been abused by different things, you know. And becoming aware, we start to take our sovereignty back and stand up. And when we stand up in our sovereignty against governments who try to abuse people, whatever. So we are uh, going to stand up against this global movement that has been uh, suffocating us for a long time, you know, taking advantage of us humans, civilians, and normies, <laughs> then we are going to take back our independence. Doing that, all these groups, governmental and corporation groups, are going to collapse and just we are going to take over and going to go towards a federated planet. A planet, I've been shown a federated planet. Every country has its own independence, culture, but all are getting on together throughout a planetary federation. No one controls anyone else. It's a federation. And once there, we still have personal problems between countries that we're humans. But it will be a step forward because the knowledge will be global. The technology will be shared globally. And rebalancing the needs in some countries who need more technological advance than others, for instance, countries in actually in development, you know. So once this will happen, all the technology that was kept away from us by these annoying corporation and governmental groups globally, this technology, all these patents will be set free again and ruled out. And also we will go the step forward. Everything we've always wanted to develop technologically, we will be able to because we will have the support of our, our governments. We will be able to go fast. And I've been told that it's going to go so fast suddenly that it will be nearly disturbing, you know, it will go exponentially in, in speed in development. It, it's going to be quite impressive. Once that becomes something that people invest money and it's free, and if some of this technology of the secret space program gets transferred to the civilian realm, they themselves are tools for building more. Like we can start building more on top of them. Like the big question is, when is it? Will we be alive? As things are going at the moment, 2023 or 24 is going to be a big change, big change. And after that, everything is going to go very fast. In one single word, is the future brighter for mankind or dark? Brighter. The future is brighter. And you know, Paolo, the future, we are making it. The date when things will start to develop we are making this date. We are the ones who are making this happen. We are the ones who are making, are going to make changes for these retained technologies to be available for everyone. But let always think the step further. We need to get ready. We need to prepare for these changes, not waiting that technology will be released, but thinking the step further by working already at developing the step further of these technologies. What can we do with it and what can we apply these technologies to? So with that said, I thank you for being here and taking your time and thank you everybody. You're going to have uh, more details about her books and her work. She has, uh, you have two books, correct? 
yes, and a third does. one coming, and maybe a fourth one coming that I want to convince you to write. Thank you, Elena. It was a great pleasure having you here. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. We will discuss above top secret technological developments at the first Silicon Valley conference on secret space technologies business applications. Experiences and witnesses of advanced technology will present how they have interacted with innovations and discoveries far beyond our current reality, but that may be one day not too far from becoming our reality. In this conference, we will discuss the futuristic civilian applications of these technologies to our economy. It's about time that we start challenging our current beliefs and limitations and start to envision a more advanced civilization for us and our children. One day we may be using some of these secret space technologies to build viable civilian business applications.